Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Perseverance and Ingenuity have been exploring Mars for the last six months, and they've really managed to pick up the pace with which they traverse the surface. You can see in the top right an animation showing flight number nine of Ingenuity as it crossed this dune area in a 625 meter flight. That's one third of a mile. And it was able to, of course, take a shortcut that the rover couldn't do. And the rover, meanwhile, has engaged its own automatic navigation capabilities. It has a, an onboard image processor that can do stereographic image processing to pull out hazards. And I think one of the best examples of this is this sequence here, showing the rover carefully negotiating its way across the surface and avoiding hitting ingenuity, which was on the left side of the image there for a moment. And these are obviously great technologies which help with the mission, but the mission itself is about doing geology on Mars. And most importantly, this is supposed to be a precursor to the Mars sample return mission. It's supposed to be using its amazing array of super high-tech instruments to analyze the geology and find the best rocks so that they can take samples and cache those samples so that a later mission can come along collect those and return them to Earth without having to spend a lot of time traversing the surface to find the interesting bits of geology. Unfortunately, the first sample attempt hasn't quite gone as planned. So the sampling works by using a drill to drill a core, right? So there's a hollow core to that, which is then supposed to be removed from the hole and placed in a test tube for return to Earth. Problem was, after they selected their target, performed their drilling, they found there was nothing in the tube. And so the next place they looked was the hole that they had just drilled, and, well, there was nothing in there. Uh, this was a view in the daytime. It looked pretty empty, but just in case they took another image at nighttime, they could see all the way to the bottom using the LED illumination. Yeah, the rock sample had basically disintegrated, and they, they did some analysis. Those little points there are where they've zapped it with a laser and tried to you know measure the properties so it just seemed that the rock that they looked at this time was not great it was too fragile and the core probably broke up as they were drilling the thing is though what i really want to talk about is the fact that we actually have samples of mars on earth that you probably heard of martian meteorites and if you've given any thought at all to this, you might have wondered, how do we know that these rocks are from the surface of Mars when we haven't had any samples of rocks from the surface of Mars to compare them against? So the way rocks get from the surface of Mars to space is they get knocked off by collisions with larger objects. And these can be pretty high energy. They can throw off a lot of mass and some of that will be going fast enough to reach escape velocity from Mars. So there it goes off into deep space and there's a not insignificant chance that these rocks can get perturbed down into orbits that cross the Earth and possibly hit the Earth. One simulation showed that as much as 1-2% to 2 of rocks knocked off Mars can ultimately reach the surface of the Earth. I mean, many fall back to Earth, some go into the asteroid belt and some just ultimately decay into the Sun. But of course, that's not the only process that results in rocks falling to Earth. And, you know, during the history of meteorite science, there's been a lot of questions uh, that still aren't actually answered about where all the different types of meteorites come from. You know, 200 and something years ago, scientists didn't even believe that rocks fell from the sky. I remember reading a science book that belonged to my dad, and it said that meteorites actually came from volcanic eruptions on the moon. And this was apparently quite a common belief around the time. So, you know, if you were like a CIA agent in the 1960s charged with faking the moon landing, you'd want to make sure that the minerals and samples brought back from the moon looked a lot like meteorites. Well, guess what? The stuff that came back from the moon looked nothing like meteorites. I mean, sure, here on the left is a chondrite with its tiny little nodules. On the right, you've got a piece of lunar basalt. And they look totally different but what really matters to scientists is the chemistry and your rocks moon rocks have a different uh, magnesium to iron ratio they have different lethanum to potassium ratios and these are fingerprints and in early 1982 a rock was recovered from the allen hills region of antarctica and it was called ah81005 
And through a great amount of analysis, it was shown that all these elemental and you know, mineral ratios matched up to the moon. And so it was declared in 1983 that this was the first lunar meteorite ever confirmed. And indeed, if you want to own a piece of the moon, you pretty much have to have got it from a meteorite because the Apollo samples aren't supposed to be distributed to private owners and neither have the, the samples from the uh, Luna missions. This is an image of a slice through what's believed to be the largest lunar meteorite recovered, and it's in Steve Jurvetson's collection near me. But for Mars, the situation is different. We haven't had that sample come back, and a lot of this kind of work that is needed to identify these really small uh, you know, chemical composition cues are, are things that need to be done in a lab. We've sent spacecraft with amazing scientific instruments that have bombarded the rocks with radiation and got all sorts of interesting spectra. They vaporized the rock and looked at the light coming off of it. And all of these are great. But it was a much more low-tech instrument flown back in the Vikings in the 1970s, which have given us the scientific cues that let us link these rocks on Earth back to the surface of Mars. But long before the link to Mars was established, it was very clear that there were these groups of meteorites which were very different from others. And one of the things that meteorite scientists do is they try to classify meteorites into different groups based upon their properties, based upon their chemistry. And this is supposed to be an indicator of a common origin. And so right down the bottom of this table, we have three types of uh, meteorites. And they're all named after where they were originally found. There's the Shergatites, which were found in Shergote uh, in India. They are the, the Naklites, which are from the Nakla meteorite found, I believe, in North Africa, in Egypt. And then there's the Chassignites found in Chassigny in France. I probably mispronounced that. And to be clear, these are just where the first example was found. Later examples would be put in this group, even if they were found elsewhere in the world. One of the most striking things about these meteorites was their age. So geology has some standard tools for measuring the age of volcanic rock. That is the age at which the rock went from a liquid to a solid. And when that happens, it freezes elements and their isotopes in, and the changes that happen due to radioactivity can be used to date the rock. One Obvious example is uranium lead dating, where you have zircon, which is a mineral, and it will incorporate uh, uranium into its structure. It won't exclude it, but it will stop lead getting in there. So if you find lead in a zircon crystal, it has to have come from the radioactive decay of, of something else. And you can look at the two isotopes of uranium that decay to it, uranium-238 and 235, and they have different decay paths that take different times. So you can actually use this to pretty accurately gauge the time of uh, solidification of any uh, rock. And uranium lead is just one of many different dating mechanisms, and you can use them all and cross-correlate between them to get pretty accurate ages. So for regular meteorites, most of those date to about 4.5 billion years ago during the formation of the solar system. The rocks that have come from Mars have dates that are much more recent. I, I believe the Naklites have dates of about 1.4 billion years ago, and the Shergatites are like 100 million years ago. So these strange meteorites must have come from a body which was geologically active for billions of years, something the size of a planet. But the real proof comes from something that happened during the impact. And this big impact, the energy causes the material to get thrown off, but it also heats the material and you get glasses formed near the surface. And in these glasses, you can get tiny gas bubbles trapping the atmosphere of Mars. And when scientists used their labs to analyze these really tiny quantities of gas which were trapped in these meteorites during this fury of their uh, expulsion from the planet, they found that the ratio of gases, and very specifically the noble gases, exactly matched those that were observed by Viking back in the 1970s. And so when Mars Science Laboratory, also known as Curiosity, went back to Mars, it included a, the instrumentation to perform new analyses of all this data. And not only did it confirm all this, but it also found periodic variations in methane and other sorts of interesting, uh, well, mysteries, which we would really like the answers to. Now, this sort of detailed isotopic analysis on the meteorites uh, also gives us all sorts of other information. So we figure out when they formed geologically. Uh, we 
know now that they come from Mars, but you know what? In moving from Earth to Mars, they spent a certain amount of time in space. And space can be quite a harsh environment. Those cosmic rays are coming in and they can actually shatter some of these molecules. They can create spallation elements, as we call them. And by measuring the formation of spallation elements, you can in turn figure out how long an object spent in space. And because all the objects, all the meteorites, are relatively recent arrivals to Earth, this means we've actually been able to date when these things were knocked off of Mars. And this table just shows you several clusterings which were observed. There was a bunch of knacklites with an age of 10.8 million years. There's uh, basaltic shergatites, 2.4 million years. These are all rocks that came from the same impact and were thrown out into space at the same time. And they've arrived at Earth roughly at the same time so they can be di uh, discovered. And there are scientists that claim to have associated certain objects with certain craters on Mars. And this is, of course, based on the chemistry being roughly the same, the estimated age of the material matching that of the formation ages of the rocks, and the formation age of the crater being roughly in the right ballpark for the amount of time these objects spent in space. I mean, the evidence for this is pretty good, but we wouldn't really be able to confirm this unless we actually sent a rover or other spacecraft in there to get samples. But I think perhaps the biggest stretch or leap in imagination is uh, Martian fossils found in Martian meteorites. Was there life on Mars? There could well be. Is this an example of it? Well, there's a lot of other processes that have been found to explain things like this. This was found in another Allen Hills meteorite. It was AH84001. And there's been so much analysis done to this rock that we found all sorts of clues that point one way or another, all sorts of evidence of biological material, although some of it may have come from its time spent on Earth. And I guess the best chance of resolving this argument is when we finally get samples back from Mars, perhaps a decade from now, then we will be able to submit uh, this material to the barrage of testing that we can on Earth. And hopefully we will find new clues to Mars past and possibly find that life is not as unique to the Earth as we have thought. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.